I too love the Book of Mormon. Our family is blessed to have a little boy named Benjamin. And several years ago, our family had the opportunity to live in the Holy Land for a, for a short while. When we came home, Benjamin was just old enough to go to primary. And so we all went to see his first day at primary. And Sister Blair, the primary president, took him up to the front and she said, this is Benjamin. We're so happy to have him in the primary. And then she said, Benjamin, are you named after the Benjamin in the Bible? And our little Benjamin looked at her and he said fiercely, no, Sister Blair, I'm named after King Benjamin in the Book of Mormon. <laughs> and that's the way we feel about the Book of Mormon. Tonight I'd like to speak about one of my favorite sermons in all of Scripture, the sermon that Abinadi gives to the priest of Noah. Abinadi is one of the most eloquent witnesses in all of Scripture of the coming of the Messiah and his mission. Not only did he prophesy the coming of Christ, but he explained the doctrinal significance of his mortal ministry. The story of Abinadi is found in Mosiah 12 through 17 and is one of the most memorable of all of the Book of Mormon's stories. On the surface, it is a very simple story, a confrontation between a prophet of the Lord and a proud and wicked king and his priests. Abinadi condemns them for their iniquity and he teaches them the true doctrine of the coming of the Messiah that God himself shall come down among the children of men and shall redeem his people. The wicked priests became angry. They accused Abinadi of blasphemy, and then they killed him, scourging him to death with fire. As we read and ponder this story, it becomes clear that there is much in this narrative beyond the simple storyline. For from Abinadi's discourses and through his martyrdom, we find that the coming of the Messiah will involve each of us in a very profound way. Throughout this story, Abinadi explains that what will happen to him shall be as a type and a shadow of things of which are to come. The fabric of scripture is woven with types and shadows. One of the keys to understanding scriptural stories is to learn to recognize and explore these types and shadows in these stories. Certain individuals in the scriptural stories loom so large as to cast their shadow into the future. Men like Adam, Enoch, Melchizedek, Abraham, and Moses all lived exemplary lives that pointed the children of the covenant towards the central event in history, the coming of Christ. The accounts of their lives were monumental, and they cast a shadow into the future, pointing all who emulated them towards Christ. The story of Abinadi is full of types and shadows. Its meaning is brought sharply into focus as we look in scriptural history for the types it represents and as we explore the shadows projected into the future. The story of Abinadi looks back to the type of Moses, the prophet likened to Christ, and to Isaiah's prophecies of the coming of God to earth as the Messiah. His life and death foreshadow the coming of Jesus Christ. Abinadi, through the type of Moses, explains the law and through his interpretation of Isaiah, explains the prophets. In short, this remarkable Book of Mormon prophet explains to us the meaning of the Old Testament as it would be fulfilled in Christ. Most importantly, Abinadi explains in great doctrinal detail the significance of the mortal ministry of Jesus Christ and his atonement. He explains to us what Isaiah meant when he said that the Messiah would see his seed and he invites us to become the seed of Christ. The story of Abinadi is framed in the story of Moses and his confrontation with Pharaoh. It begins with the reign of King Noah, the epitome of a wicked king, wickedness, immorality, idolatry, taxation, drunkenness, and riotous living. Noah surrounds himself with a select group of priests who share his values and support him in his wickedness. Throughout taxation, Noah has put his people in bondage. In spite of their wickedness, King Noah and his people win a great victory in battle against the Lamanites. They begin to boast in their own strength and delight in the shedding of blood. 
To this people the Lord called Abinadi to be prophet and to proclaim to the people that unless they repented, the Lord would visit them in anger. They would be delivered into the hands of their enemies and they would be brought into bondage. Abinadi went forth reciting to his people the same words that Moses had spoken centuries before to the children of Israel, warning them about idolatry. In Mosiah 11.22, Abinadi quotes the Lord, And it shall come to pass that they shall know that I am the Lord their God, and I am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of my people. When Noah heard these words, he was enraged. The first words spoken by King Noah in the Book of Mormon echo the precise words first spoken by Pharaoh to Moses and Aaron. Who is Abinadi, that I and my people should be judged of him? Or who is the Lord that shall bring unto my people such great affliction? Further, the Book of Mormon records that Noah, like Pharaoh, hardened his heart. Abinadi fled for his life, but returned after two years with the same message and enumerated a list of sins and signs that would occur if the people did not repent. Signs reminiscent of the plagues of Moses, afflictions, famine, pestilence, bondage, hail, the east wind and insects, even the death of Noah, whose life shall be valued even as a garment in a hot furnace. For these prophecies, Abinadi was arrested and brought before the king and his priests for cross-examination with the intent of making a formal and legal accusation against him. Finally, one of the priests asks Abinadi to interpret the passage in Isaiah 52, 7 through 10 that begins. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings. This passage ends... The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Abinadi responded to this question with a series of questions of his own. He addressed the priests. Are you priests and pretend to teach the people? What teach ye this people? If ye teach the law of Moses, why do ye not keep it? He then challenged them by reading the first of the Ten Commandments and asked them why they did not obey them. By this time, the king had had enough and ordered his priests to take Abinadi away and kill him. The Lord intervened, and Abinadi was transfigured before them, for the Spirit of the Lord was upon him, and his face shone with exceeding luster, even as Moses did while on the Mount of Sinai while speaking with the Lord. Under divine protection, Abinadi then finished reading the Ten Commandments to the priests. Having represented Moses as the lawgiver, Abinadi then compared the priests of Noah with the children of Israel who were stiff-necked and quick to do iniquity and invoked Moses as prophet. For behold, did not Moses prophesy unto them concerning the coming of the Messiah? Abinadi then quotes Isaiah 53 as the prophecy of the coming of Jesus Christ. Abinadi taught the law of Moses was a law of performances and of ordinances that were types of things to come and that there could not be any man saved except it were through the redemption of God. He testified that this redemption was taught and prophesied by all the prophets since the world began, and that Moses the lawgiver prophesied unto them concerning the coming of the Messiah, and that God should redeem his people. The center of Abinadi's message to Noah and his priests is the fulfillment of the law of Moses and the prophecies of all of the prophets in the future coming of God to earth as the Messiah. In Mosiah 13, 33 to 35, Abinadi identifies five specific teachings about the Messiah that was taught by all of the prophets. We're just going to read this passage. For behold, did not Moses prophesy unto them concerning the coming of the Messiah, and that God should redeem his people? Yea, and even all the prophets who have prophesied ever since the world began, have they not spoken more or less concerning these things? And then he adds the five points, the five points that we're going to explore tonight uh, as, as found in Isaiah chapter 53. Number one, have they not said that God himself should come down among the children of men? Number two, and take upon him the form of man? Number three, and go forth in mighty power upon the face of the earth. Number four. 
Yea, and have they not said also that he should bring to pass the resurrection of the dead? Number five, and that he himself should be oppressed and afflicted. Abinadi then proceeded to read Isaiah 53 in its entirety in Mosiah 14 as evidence for these doctrines. Isaiah 53 is a poetic description of the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, who would come as a suffering servant. It should be noted that the entire chapter of Isaiah 53 in Mosiah 14 is a poem. It's divided into four stanzas of three verses each, one through three, four through six, seven through nine, 10 through 12. It is constructed with the well-known Hebrew parallelism. Much of Isaiah's figurative language is open to various interpretations. Following his recitation of Isaiah 53 in Mosiah 14, Abinadi then explains with great clarity in chapter 15, the mission of the Messiah. And in chapter 15, he quotes, paraphrases, and explains some of the most important phrases and images from Isaiah chapter 15, chapter 53. As the earthly ministry of the Savior unfolded in the meridian of time, most, if not all of those who followed him, did not completely understand the significance of his mission as it was described in Isaiah 53. After his crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension, however, early Christians were able to see clearly the meaning of many of Isaiah's prophecies about the Messiah, as Nephi said in 2 Nephi 25, 7. Nevertheless, in the days that the prophecies of Isaiah shall be fulfilled, men shall know of a surety at that time when they shall come to pass. Jews, on the other hand, have continued to read chapter 53 as a prophecy directed to the suffering servant as the house of Israel. While it is clear that the whole of chapter 53 is about the mortal ministry of the Messiah, even among Latter-day Saints, there are various interpretations of some of the particulars. The point is, however, that Abinadi's interpretation of Isaiah 53 precedes the coming of Christ by almost 150 years, and yet it remains the most clear and replete interpretation of this prophetic chapter anywhere in scripture. While a complete analysis of this chapter is not possible this evening, here let us review this important Isaiah chapter using Abinadi's five statements as a guide. We will note that the passages that might be interpreted in the light of Abinadi's five statements, and then quote some of the most important phrases from Abinadi's sermon in Mosiah 15 that explain the content of these passages. Number one, have they not said that God himself should come down among the children of men? The first verse of Mosiah 14.1, or Isaiah 53.1, is most intriguing. Verse one, who hath believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? The first six verses of Mosiah 14 are put into the mouth of a first person plural narrator. The last six verses appear to be the Lord speaking. So who is this narrator? A close reading of the text suggests that the narrator of this section are those among covenant Israel who witnessed the ministry of Jesus Christ in the flesh. The opening lines pose two questions. Who will believe what will be recounted here? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? The sense of the first question, who hath believed our report, can be taken several different ways. Most obviously, it appears to be a rhetorical question, expecting a negative answer, that no one has or will believe this incredible report of God coming to earth as a mortal. On the other hand, it may be an invitation to all who hear the report to consider it and to accept and to believe it. The arm of the Lord is a central image in the second question, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? The arm of the Lord is a commonly used metaphor for the power of God in the Bible and the context, in the context of creation, in the redemption of Israel from Egypt, and in his deliverance of Israel in the last days. In the Book of Mormon, the image of the arm of the Lord occurs in the context of restoration of the gospel and the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. And the arm of mercy is associated with the power of the atonement on behalf of the repentant. In this passage, it may have a sense more vivid than the metaphor. The biblical and Book of Mormon associations of this image with creation, redemption, and Latter-day restoration, and especially with the atonement, all point towards the power of God manifested to the world through his son, Jesus Christ. Perhaps it is in this image that Abinadi would have us see that God himself, Jesus Christ, will reveal himself as the arm of the Lord. 
The question, to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed, is posed in Isaiah 52.10, in the passage the wicked priest asked Abinadi to interpret. At the end of his description of the coming of Christ and his death and resurrection, Abinadi explained by reading this passage of Isaiah in Mosiah 15.31. The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. It is interesting to note that the Hebrew word for salvation, Yahshua, is the same root as the name Jesus, from its shortened form, Yehoshua. Perhaps it is in this passage that Abinadi has in mind when he says in Mosiah 15.1, I would that ye should understand that God himself shall come down among the children of men and shall redeem his people. Now let's move to statement number two and take upon him the form of a man. And we're going to read now from Mosiah chapter 14, verse 2, or Isaiah 53, verse 2. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and, we shall see, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. This imagery graphically portrays Abinadi's second statement, that God will take upon himself the form of a man. The Messiah will grow and mature as a plant, growing out of the dry ground. This may be an allusion to the fact that the Messiah was born of a mortal woman, was placed in a manger as Mary's baby, and grew to an adulthood in a way similar to other mortals. The statement that he had no form nor comeliness, nor beauty that we should desire him, described the Messiah's coming in plainness, with none of the royal outwardly trappings that many expect of, of the Davidic Messiah. The phrase, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Describe his mortal life, as one in which he experienced a full range of the experiences of mortality. Chief among these was rejection. He came into the world and was ignored, despised and not esteemed by those he had come to save. In chapter 15, Abinadi explains, and because he dwelleth in the flesh, he shall be called the son of God. And thus the flesh becoming subject to the spirit, suffereth temptation and yieldeth not to the temptation, but suffereth himself to be mocked and scourged and cast out and disowned by his people. Statement number three. And go forth in mighty power upon the face of the earth. We're going to read this together with statement number four. Uh, we're going to read this with, with, with verse number four, rather. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquities of, all, of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and like a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. The first two lines may be intended to be a description of the Savior's ministry to heal the sick and to cast out devils. It is in this way that is interpreted in Matthew in his gospel. When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, himself took our infirmities and bare our sickness. In addition, these images are an apt description of the suffering of the Savior in the Garden of Gethsemane and the cross when he took the sins and the afflictions of the world upon himself as described by Alma. And he will take upon him their infirmities that his bowels may be filled with mercy according to the flesh, that he may know according to the flesh how to succor his people according to their infirmities. Abinadi later explains in Mosiah 15, 6, and after this, after working many mighty miracles among the children of men, he shall be led, yea, even as Isaiah said, as a sheep before the shearer is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Yea, and have they, this is statement number four, 
Yea, and have they not said also that he shall bring to pass the resurrection of the dead? And statement number five, and that he himself should be oppressed and afflicted. There are a host of dramatic images in Isaiah 53 that describe these aspects of the ministry of the Messiah. These two themes are woven together both in Isaiah's prophecy as well as in Abinadi's interpretation. And now let's look at verse five. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgressions of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no evil, neither was any deceit in his mouth, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. These verses describe the judgment and the death of the Savior, that he was executed with the wicked and buried with the rich. It is possible that the phrase, he shall prolong his days, is a reference to the resurrection of the Messiah and of his seed. Abinadi interpreted the phrase, and who shall declare his generation, with a description of Jesus Christ as the spiritual father of those who accept and follow him. Abinadi says, Behold, I say unto you, that when his soul has been made an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. And now, what say ye? And who shall be his seed? One of the very most important contributions of Abinadi's prophetic commentary on Isaiah is to explain that the reference to the seed of the Messiah is a reference to those who will accept and follow him. Abinadi used this reference to the seed of the Messiah in his explanation to the priests of Noah of the passage in Isaiah 52, 7 through 10. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings. Abinadi explains all of these verses as foreshadowing the rejection, death, and resurrection of the Messiah and his power to give to his followers eternal life. He says the following, Yea, even so he shall be led, crucified, and slain, the flesh becoming subject even unto death, the will of the Son being swallowed up in the will of the Father, and thus God breaketh the bands of death, having gained victory over death, giving the Son power to make intercession for the children of men, having ascended into heaven, having the bowels of mercy, being filled with compassion towards the children of men, standing betwixt them and justice, having broken the bands of death, taken upon himself their iniquity and their transgressions, having redeemed them and satisfied the demands of justice. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. We're going to read verse 10 now. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. The story of Abinadi entices and then entraps us as readers. We, the audience, are drawn at first to the story by our sympathy for this man of God and for his unpleasant and painful task of calling a wicked king to repentance. As Abinadi strides onto the stage in the robes of Moses, he meets Noah as Pharaoh. And we are reminded that the story of Moses and Pharaoh is a type of the timeless conflict between prophets proclaiming the need for humility and repentance and hard-hearted, proud, and wicked leaders of iniquitous yet successful people. As members of the covenant, we are challenged by Abinadi's reading of the law to the priests of Noah. We must put ourselves in their places and ask ourselves the hard question. If we believe and teach the law, then why don't we live it? And do we remember that salvation comes through the redemption of Christ and not only through the law? Then incredibly, Abinadi draws us into the story. As the narrators of the words of Isaiah in Mosiah 14, 1 through 6, who puts into the mouth of Israel the question, who hath believed our report? We describe the mortal ministry of the Messiah. When we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And with his stripes, we are healed. Finally, we as Israel betray ourselves. 
All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquities of us all. The Lord then addresses each individual among us in Mosiah 14.10. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. We, of course, want to know what this individual challenge means. And Abinadi does not disappoint us. When he finishes the citation of Isaiah 53, he immediately turns to the question of the seed of the Messiah and explains in plain language that God Jesus Christ himself will come down to earth to redeem his people, that he will be both the Son and the Father. The Son because he dwelleth in the flesh and subjects the will of the flesh to the will of the Father. And the Father, because he is God, and because he was conceived by the power of God. In this way, we come to understand the full import of the image of the seed of the Messiah. He then describes the way in which the Messiah will justify many, will divide the spoil with the strong, and make intercession for the transgressors. Abinadi teaches that redemption came through death, resurrection, and the ascension of the Messiah with the following language. And thus God breaketh the bands of death, giving the Son power to make intercession for the children of men. Having ascended into heaven, having the bowels of mercy, being filled with compassion towards the children of men, standing betwixt them and justice, having broken the bands of death, taken upon himself their iniquity and their transgressions, having redeemed them and satisfied the demands of justice. Abinadi teaches in Mosiah 15, 10 through 11, when his soul has been made an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. And who shall be his seed? Whosoever has heard the words of the prophets, have hearkened unto their words, and believed that the Lord would redeem his people. These are his seed, or they that are the heirs of the kingdom of God. Finally, Abinadi turns to answer the original question posed by the priests of Noah. The identity of him who stands on the mountains to publish peace and proclaim the good tidings. Abinadi first identifies this entity as the seed of the Messiah, the prophets and those who have hearkened unto their words. And these are they who have published peace, and oh how beautiful upon the mountains were their feet. He then identifies the Messiah as oh how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, even the Lord who has redeemed his people. With this comparison, Abinadi has dramatically presented us with a powerful type and shadow of the Messiah. For even as he will proclaim the good tidings from the mountain, so will those who follow him, his seed, proclaim the tidings from the mountain with him. This typology explains a very important part of the Abrahamic covenant. The Lord promised Abraham, in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. This, of course, was fulfilled in a very specific way with the coming of the Messiah through the lineage of Abraham to bless the nations of the earth through the atonement. This is attested by the genealogies in Matthew chapter 1. At the same time, the Abrahamic covenant promises that the seed of Abraham, including all that accept the gospel, shall bear the ministry and priesthood unto all nations. And through this seed of Abraham shall all the families of the earth be blessed even with the blessings of the gospel, which are the blessings of salvation, even life eternal. In the end, we sorrow as Abinadi's message is rejected. We are powerless to save him from the priests of Noah. Abinadi was killed by fire for his testimony of the iniquities and for the coming of God to earth. His rejection is in the type of the ministry of Moses, who delivered the law to hard-hearted people and was finally taken from their midst. Abinadi's death was a type and shadow of the coming of the Messiah and his rejection and death. He fulfills his calling as one of the holy prophets who have opened their mouths testifying of the Messiah, and thus he became the seed of Christ. They who have published peace and have brought good tidings of good, who have published salvation and said unto Zion, Thy God reigneth, and oh how beautiful upon the mountains were their feet. Abinadi's death also foreshadowed the death of King Noah, and the descendants of his wicked priests that were burned by fire, just as they had killed Abinadi. Remember in the Exodus story, Pharaoh and his armies ironically suffered death in the waters of the Red Sea. 
the same death that Pharaoh had decreed upon the Hebrew male children to be cast into the water. But there was one among them whose name was Alma. Abinadi did not die in vain, for in declaring repentance he had brought one soul to repentance, and this one soul would bring many, many more. One of Noah's priests, a man named Alma, heard the words of the prophet, and he believed the words which Abinadi had spoken, for he knew concerning the iniquity which Abinadi had testified against them. Just as Abinadi is a type of Moses and a shadow of Jesus Christ, who delivered his message and then was rejected and killed, so Alma becomes a type and shadow for us, the readers. When his defense of the prophet failed, Alma fled for his life into the wilderness, where he hid and wrote down the words of Abinadi. We next see Alma in the wilderness, where he repented of his sins and iniquities. And he went among his people and began to teach the words of Abinadi. Indeed, Alma's words resonate with those of Abinadi, for he taught concerning that which was to come, and also concerning the resurrection of the dead, and the redemption of the people, which was to be brought to pass through the power and sufferings and death of Christ, and his resurrection and ascension into heaven. And thus we see that Alma, following in the footsteps of Abinadi, also became the seed of Christ. Abinadi explains, whosoever has heard the words of the prophets, Yea, all the holy prophets who have prophesied concerning the coming of the Lord, and that all those who have hearkened unto their words and believed that the Lord would redeem his people and have looked forward to the day for remission of their sins, I say unto you that these are his seed, and they are the heirs of the kingdom of God, and these are they who have published peace and have brought good tidings of good, who have published salvation and have said unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. And oh, how beautiful upon the mountains were their feet. Not only did Alma become the seed of Christ, but also his posterity after him, for he became the ancestor of generations of prophets who kept the sacred records and served the Nephites as ecclesiastical and political leaders for the next 400 years. And so at the end of the story, we find ourselves with Alma in the wilderness. There he instructs us how through baptism, we can, like him, become the seed of Christ and how we too, through baptism, can follow the Lord and become the feet of those who shall hereafter publish peace, yea, from this time henceforth and forever. Listen to the words who are, to those who are about to be baptized. And now, as ye are desirous to come into the fold of God and to be called his people, and are willing to bear one another's burdens, that they may be light, Yea, and are willing to mourn with those that mourn, yea, and comfort those that stand in need of comfort, and to stand as witnesses of God at all times and in all things, and in all places that ye may be in, even until death, that ye may be redeemed of God, and be numbered with those of the first resurrection, that ye may have eternal life. And thus we receive the good tidings, proclaimed by Moses, Isaiah, Abinadi, and Christ. Oh, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of them! And while we may not be called, like Moses, to confront Pharaoh, or Isaiah to prophesy the coming of the Messiah, or Abinadi to die as a witness of his message, and while we cannot take upon ourselves the sins of the world as did the Messiah, we can follow Alma and take upon ourselves the burdens of others to mourn with those that mourn and to stand as witness of God at all times, things, and places. Through our baptismal covenants, we become those who hearken unto the words of the prophet. We become the seed of Jesus Christ, and we join them upon the mountains where we publish peace, bring good tidings, publish salvation, and say unto Zion, thy God reigneth. Oh, how beautiful upon the mountains are their feet. Let me leave you with my testimony that Jesus Christ lives, that he loves us, that he has paid for our sins, that he continues to speak to us through living prophets and through the Book of Mormon, which invites us to become his seed and to join him on the mountain where we may publish peace and say to all, thy God reigneth. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.